Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, BCIT Med Lab uh, information uh, session. Uh, we hope that you find this a, uh, a valuable uh, event to help you uh, uh, make a decision that could uh, change, your, change your life, a good career choice. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce some people here. Um, with us is uh, Lisa Chu, our associate, Jean, uh, associate dean, not G. Uh, Andre Caron, he's our program head, and uh, Bavina uh, Gordia, program advisor, and uh, Jesse Taylor over here is program advisor. He's going to be fielding questions from uh, those people that are joining us online. Uh, my name's uh, Alan Rempel, and I'm going to be your MC. I'm just going to introduce people and help guide the, uh, the event tonight. Uh, I'm an instructor in the uh, program, so uh, if you have any questions later on, I may be able to help you as well. Um, with respect to the questions, if uh, there will be about a 10-minute period after uh, we've uh, gone through some, uh, uh, some program um, slides and uh, some testimonials from, um, uh, from current students and past students, and then we'll, uh, we'll field a bunch of questions that you have. Uh, at the end of today, or this evening, there is going to be uh, an opportunity for you to meet with uh, people from the uh, from industry, from health authorities, up in uh, Town Square A and B. So make sure that uh, you head up there after the uh, after the presentations. So, so what I'd like to do is take uh, is introduce uh, Lisa Chu here. She'd like to say a few things about uh, BCIT and the MedLab program. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm, warm welcome to everyone um, in person as well as online. It's nice to see all of you here. Um, and the next little while, you'll be hearing about the program, learning about the program, the various courses. Um, you'll also be hearing from some of our alumni, our grads from the program, and, and how they found their experiences. You'll also be hearing from our clinical lab partners, the, from the health authorities, as well as from Life Lab, our private uh, clinic partners. Um, part of our success at BCIT in the program is our collaboration and partnership with our clinical partners, whether it be from the health authorities or from Life Labs, a, a private clinic. Um, another pillar of our success at BCIT is really our faculty. So if you do decide to join our program, you'll be working with a fantastic faculty, very dedicated, very committed to the work. Um, so, if you, so if you do, um, plan to, to uh, join us and apply. Uh, you be in for a great experience. Um, there'd be a great career ahead of you in the health authorities and health services, but also a very a great experience as being a student here at BCIT. Um, being part of a cohort of 80 people, um, you'd be developing a lot of good friendships, long-lasting friendships, a lot of camaraderie, but also the experience of being a student. Um, so uh, besides a great career in the future, but also a fantastic student experience. And amazing experience. So welcome again tonight. Um, um, enjoy yourself and um, welcome again from the School of Health as well as from BCIT. Thank you. Okay, so Andre Caron is going to come up here. He's going to give you an overview of the program. And then we have a, uh, a short video, about five minutes, uh, from Work BC, and it will uh, outline uh, in a more graph, in a more video graphic, exciting way, what MedLab career is all about. Hi, everybody. Um, again, thanks for uh, coming tonight. Uh, we appreciate. Um, all the interest and enthusiasm. Uh, so I'm just going to go over uh, sort of uh, what the med lab profession is. So some of you may be here wondering what do we do. Some of you have already done your homework and have looked into that. Um, so bear with us. But right now um, I'm going to go over what the med lab profession is. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the admissions process and just sort of what a day in the life would look like here on campus. So just to begin, what is a med lab technologist? Okay, well, first things first is we're a very important um, and instrumental uh, uh, profession within the healthcare team. 
Okay, so we use a variety of complex instruments. Okay, so we analyze tissue samples, blood or body fluids. And what we do is we come up with a, uh, a, some reports or values. Okay, so we take all of this information, this diagnostic procedure, and we supply the physicians with a uh, results or a set of results. From those set of results, the physicians are able to um, have a, an appropriate or accurate diagnosis, but also it will help them in the treatment of the patient. So that sort of gives you a broad scope. So we use complex instruments <clears throat> and we work within a diagnostic procedure in order to come up with the reports or the results for physicians uh, to analyze and, and interpret. Um, so something to keep in mind, just as we always thought was an interesting stat, is that 85% of the work that we do um, is going to be used in the diagnosis of a patient. Okay, so that's really, uh, if you think about that, so if somebody comes to the hospital for any particular reason, um, a lot of our work will help that person. So you are directly involved or indirectly involved in helping those people. Um, so where is it that you'll be working? You're going to be working in hospitals, uh, private labs. You could work in university research centers. Uh, you can work in the public health facilities, uh, biotechnology companies. Uh, you can also work in specialty labs. Um, and just to kind of build on that a bit, when you're working in these areas, you can also build on your career at these areas. So for instance, you can work into administration or management. We even had some lab techs move on <clears throat> to different healthcare roles, such as physicians. Uh, you can work for, again, biotech companies within the sales or anything like that, or their um, IT services. So there's a lot of avenues you could take once you're uh, within the profession in the field. So what's the job market look like? Because a lot of you are probably wondering, will I get a job at the end of this? Um, so right now I could tell you that the demand for med lab professionals is very high. Okay, so the expansion rate is high right now with a lot of um, industry and the population growth. We've also got <clears throat> a lot of uh, retirees right now happening. So right now um, the province, and I can even speak for Canada, is looking for med lab techs. Okay, so that is something to keep in mind that um, all of our students that are graduating are getting jobs at different capacities, but they are working out there right now. Um, also, in terms of salary, you'll, uh, you'll get a professional level salary to go along uh, with your career. Um, and something also to note that when you finish the program, you're going to write an exam that will allow you to work um, across Canada. Okay, so that'll allow you to move if you have to. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is when you are in the profession, it's not just you take this schooling, you're done, you get a job, and that's it. You'll find that there are lots of opportunities even within this field to do continuing education, to, uh, I don't know, if they have a new instrument that they're working up, they may <clears throat> ask you to be on a team to go to that place and do training and then provide that training to your colleagues um, in the lab. So. It doesn't stop here at PCIT, it will eventually continue on in your career as a lab tech. So there will be lots of opportunities for you uh, to gain extra knowledge um, when working. Um, so like I said before, you're going to be working a lot of high-tech equipment. So a lot of people find that really cool, they like to work with that stuff. Great, this is probably for you because you do get to use a lot of that stuff. And at the end of the day, you are working independently on your lab work on the bench. But you'll also, um, indirectly, or through your work, you're going to be helping people, helping patients. So that's really important to kind of keep in mind, too. <clears throat> so there are a couple disciplines uh, that we teach here, but also that you're going to be working in in the field. So these are the, the ones that are presented here. These are the ones that you'll be potentially working in. So chemistry, histology, micro, uh, molecular diagnostics, microbiology, transfusion science and hematology. Okay, so those are the core areas that you'll be working in. And as you can see, there is a description for each of those areas as to what they perform, what, um, what is their role. Um, 
so for instance, if we look at microbiology, they're studying bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Okay, so that's what they'll focus on in that area, and that's what you'll be working on in that area. Um, so some common tests, I'm only going to pick a few just for examples, but if you were to take sort of the clinical chemistry group, um, again, you're looking at conducting tests on blood and body fluids, and you're going to be detecting different chemicals, drugs, or hormones. Okay, so a common test that we typically do in the lab in chemistry is blood glucose, okay, or blood sugar. Right? So we would test that to either diagnose or monitor diabetes. Okay, so that's a very common test that we would be doing. Um, <clears throat> if we looked at, say, transfusion in science, okay, so an example there would be there's a car accident and the patient is bleeding, okay, they're bleeding out, they need blood. Uh, so our job would be then to do a cross match and find the appropriate blood product for that person. So you can see that some testing is slow, it's routine, it doesn't need as much time or turnaround time, is how we describe it, or it might be an emergency and you need that test right away. Okay, so you can kind of see that the, the lab world is both, it can be slow at some times and then at time, other times it can be really fast, fast paced. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind about the profession. So, is this profession for you? Um, something to keep in mind is, uh, and you can see them noted here, if, if you find you're curious about science, you like to ask why, all of those things, this is probably for you. Uh, if you're, again, if you're fascinated by science, you're intrigued by the method of science, um, most people will generate or find themselves coming to this profession. If you're process oriented, so if you, if you, within the profession, you will be following standard operating procedures. Um, and what those procedures will do is they'll outline, for example, how is it that we conduct a test? And what do we do with those results? You know, we're not just sort of winging it every time, right? So you have to follow some sort of guidelines in order to ensure that every test has been treated the same. So each patient gets the same treatment, right? So that way we're accurate and we're precise all the way through. Um, again, so the next point is accurate, okay, so it's important that you are paying attention to detail, so you're detail-oriented, and you're looking for um, making sure that those results sent out are appropriate. Uh, Self-sufficient, so this is something that uh, um, is intriguing to a lot of people because, you know, how much is it involved with teamwork, how much is it involved with working other colleagues, or how much independency or independent time do I have? So within the profession, you are working mainly self-sufficiently by yourself, you're relying on, on your techniques, but again, like any job, there's always overlap. So you will be working with other team members in, the, in, your, in your cohort, but um, at the end of the day, you will be working on some tasks by yourself, okay? So that's why, if you like that kind of work, this is probably for you as well. Um, so some of the qualities then, you can kind of see some overlap <clears throat> so keen observational skills, color perception, and manual dexterity. Okay, so you're going to be pipetting, you're going to be working with some very delicate instruments, you're going to have to be able to manipulate them, um, or streaking um, agar plates for microbiology. Are you able to work under pressure? So like I just said uh, previously, uh, sometimes there'll be an emergency situation, and you're going to need to have to be able to work quickly and effectively. Okay, so, and, not, and be able to manage that. And some of this too, again, we're gonna be training you and teaching you. So you don't necessarily have this right away as soon as you start, but <clears throat> we will teach you this along the way, okay? Um, so like I said, work independently and part of a team, be accountable and responsible, okay? So ensuring that the results that you are sending, you are accountable for those, and that you're responsibly doing your work, okay? You're not cutting corners, any of that kind of thing. You are, um, working within uh, the right protocol. So something to keep in mind, and I'll touch base on this a little bit earlier, is with these qualities, these are something that, yes, it's good to have coming into the program, but it's also something that we look for uh, from you when we do our interview process. Okay, so when you're applying to us, we end up having a, an interview um, section. Those qualities we're gonna be looking for, okay? <clears throat> okay, so why BCIT Med Lab? Okay, there's lots of other programs um, out there. Um, so why us? Well, there's, you'll have job ready at graduation, right? So you're gonna do the didactic with us, you're gonna get all the theory, and then you're gonna get an opportunity to work in the clinical. So that's a year long practicum, all right? So you're gonna be working with other, your 
other people within the field, all your different peers, and um, by the time you've done the theory and the clinical, you'll be basically ready to work. With a little bit of training from the site, you'll, you're basically hit the ground running. So that's, that's a good thing to have. So you're ready to work. Um, like Lisa mentioned, it's a cohort model, so you'll be working as a group all the way through from level one, two, three, four, and five. Um, so some of the pros, definitely you're working with a group of people, um, you're able to build good relationships, study groups, all of those kind of things. You kind of get to go through the process and through the course together, okay? Uh, supportive learning environment. Uh, so again, like Lisa mentioned, a lot of the faculty that are um, here at BCIT have a lot of experience, both <clears throat> in the public and private sector, but also nationally and internationally. So we bring a lot of experience into this program, a lot of good examples, um, and I think uh, it's a very enriching and, um, and good program. Uh, something else is we're a CMA accredited, okay, so that's, in terms of accreditation, that's one of the best, so that's something to keep in mind. Also, we're nationally certified, uh, sorry, uh, you will be nationally certified once you're completed. So, like I said, that's the CSMLS, Canadian Society for Med Lab Science. You'll be nationally certified and it will allow you, again, to work um, all over Canada. So, what does the program look like? So that's a little bit about what we do and um, why BCIT. So now if we kind of look at the program map, um, it's broken up into uh, five levels, and I'll explain. So level one is January to May slash June. So level one is a lot of the foundational courses and other um, enriching courses for uh, professional enriching courses. So things like specimen collection, so uh, collecting blood, um, we're looking at anatomy and physiology, immunology, um, we're looking at communications. So all of those courses are in your first level, and that goes from January to May. In June, we're going to be doing a two-week phlebotomy rotation at your clinical site. So you're going to be out there collecting blood for two weeks. So it's a really good opportunity for you to, you know, you do level one, and then you're right out there in the clinical, and you, gotta, you get a feel for what the lab's like. That way, when you come back, in the fall, in September, you'll, um, again, you'll be ready and you have that experience to draw upon. So level two and three, that's where we're going to be teaching most of the uh, core courses. So like I said, the chemistries, the mo uh, molecular, hematology, all of those courses um, will be taught throughout level two and three, obviously going from uh, introductory content all the way to more complex simulated environments just before you get to clinical. Okay, so we do start you off at the beginning and then again, over the year, progressively add on and make it more sort of lifelike and realistic and simulated. So that's what level two is primarily around and built around. Level four and five, so that's your clinical, um, your clinical experience. So at your clinical, you're gonna be, uh, like I said, uh, at one of our affiliated sites, you're gonna be working there um, with, with uh, your trainers and they're going to go through um, a bunch of competencies and training you <clears throat> at, at each uh, in each discipline along the way okay so that's for one year so you'll be working at your clinical site um, completing your competencies and working again within that that field um, something to keep in mind and I've already mentioned this again but once you've completed level four and five and you're, you've passed all the competencies, we would then say that you've passed BCIT. You're good, you're done, you've graduated. After that, once you've graduated BCIT, that's when you would go on to write the national exam. And that's in June, uh, right after, so it says May, July to May. So in June, you would write your uh, national exam. All right, so again, we're preparing you for that national exam so that you're successful. Um, clinical placement, so just a little bit of detail around this. Um, so like I said, there's a two-week block, the short block, and the long block, 42 weeks. So the short one is right after level one. <clears throat> You're going to be doing two weeks collecting blood. And then the 42 weeks is that level four and five where you're going to be out there in the hospital in those designated uh, areas. Um, something to keep in mind within the clinical placement uh, you may have to go to multiple sites or there's shift work. 
Um, so again, we want to kind of create that realistic um, scenario that you're going to see once, once you're out there working. Um, so the multiple sites, not every hospital does every test or has every testing platform. So if we find that you need to learn this competency at one hospital, um, but they don't have that equipment or whatever it is, we might ask you to go to another affiliated hospital to complete those competencies. But again, we've already worked that out, so you don't have to worry about finding that. But so keep in mind, there might be some relocation or uh, multiple sites that you'll, you'll be at. Um, and again, uh, just something to note that students accepted into the program, they must be prepared uh, to complete their clinical training at one of the affiliated sites, clinical sites. Okay, so we've gathered a bunch of clinical sites that are willing to take our students and we're gonna uh, put those students at their, or uh, designate a site for those students, okay? So what are the risks of being in this program? Because we talk about a lot of things, you know, blood, tissue samples, all sorts of microbiology, like there's a lot of things happening, right? So, but keep in mind, <laughs> we are aware of all the risks and it's our job to ensure that you're, you know what the risks are and that we've taught you how to mitigate those risks. So we're, we're talking, like I said, <clears throat> infectious blood or body fluids. Um, so what personal protection are you going to need? So we'll give you that ahead of time before you start the program. But also we'll give you some training in your safety training on how to manage those risks. Okay. Um, and also you will be required to have some immunizations before you come. Okay, so that's just a given. That's to protect you from the stuff you're going to be working with. So what does it take to be successful? Well, there's a huge list of items that we think that you would benefit from. So time management, again, it's a busy program. There's a lot of things happening. You got labs, you got assignments, quizzes. Um, all of those things are happening, so you have to be a good uh, manager time appropriately. Um, again, some teamwork, interpersonal skills, um, reaching out to us if you have any questions. Like I said, we've got a wealth of knowledge within the faculty, so by all means, come to us and ask us questions. We're there to help. Um, you know, having some computer literacy and um, uh, good speaking and listening skills as well will help. Um, so just briefly about the um, application process. And I know program advising is here, so they'll probably get into more detail. But just sort of from a high level perspective, there's three steps in order to get in. Uh, step one is basically uh, meet all the entrance requirements and then apply online before June 1st. So that's step one. Um, once you've completed step one, then we're going to invite you to BCIT in June, so June 2016. We'll invite you here for multiple, any, multiple mini interview. And again, those multiple mini interviews um, we're going to be looking for those things that we just talked about. So the, uh, what, are, what are the qualities uh, that make a good lab tech? Okay, so we're going to be looking for those things um, from you. All right? So that way we ensure that, we, that, um, that this profession is the right fit for you. Okay. Step three, um, once you've been conditionally accepted, so we, you've, you've gone through step one, step two, we say, yep, everything's great, we'd like this person in. Then we'll conditionally accept you, and then from there you'll just need to give us a criminal's records check and um, immunization. That's it. And then you're good to go. So, oh, okay. Uh, so with that in mind, um, that's um, all I have for you today. So it's like I said, I just want to talk about the, what the profession is, um, a little bit about what the program map will look like sort of if this is the right job for you. And, and again, looking at that application process um, a little bit. And again, program advising, um, we'll go through that a little bit more with you. Um, so with that, I'm gonna leave you with a video um, that WorkBC has created um, in conjunction with a lab up north. I think it, this will give you a really good sort of um, visual representation of what we do in the lab. So yes, I could talk about what we do, but I think it's really important to kind of get a feel for and um, uh, feel for what they actually do through, this, through these visuals. But um, so yeah, thank you.
Our next career plays a vital role in the field of medical science. We're in the lab today to meet a medical lab technologist. Hi. Hi, I'm Jody. I'm Brian. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Let's get a lab coat on and get you started. Great. My name is Jody Simmons. I'm a medical laboratory technologist and we're at the Dawson Creek and District Hospital Lab. Medical laboratory technologist works in the lab. They run patient samples, blood and body fluids. Uh, they're tests that are ordered by a doctor and we run them on instruments and we make sure that those results are accurate and precise before we release them to the doctors. A typical day would involve coming in and waking up all our instruments and then we would have to pull quality control material to make sure that our instruments are running correctly. We would be doing any maintenance like pulling apart the instrument and cleaning it before we would want to run any patient samples. What is this machine? They we're looking at the inside of a chemistry analyzer. So when someone, for example, comes in the hospital with a heart attack or a suspected heart attack, mm -hmm. this is actually one of the instruments we use to see if there's been damage. So you're always learning about new instruments. Your day is always different. Your day is never the same. You might be learning a new instrument, a new technology. In a small lab like this, we are required to draw blood sometimes. So we'll draw the blood and bring it back to the lab. We're looking at tubes, and I'm going to tell what this person's blood type is by using my reagents and these tubes. So if you're an A pause patient, or if your blood type is O, I'll be able to tell from these from these tests. Okay. You're putting drops in tubes, and you're using pipettes and small equipment, and you're doing maintenance. So it's good to be able to work with your hands. It's good to be very organized, so you can organize your workflow and compartmentalize because you have priority specimens as well. You might get pulled from one thing and there's a stat that comes in and it's a lot more, has priority over a routine sample and you need to stop what you're doing and work on that stat specimen from the emergency, for example. Always double check your work because sure. you do not want to make a mistake. This person's bleeding in the merge and they need blood quickly. You need to work quickly but accurately as well. I don't think people realize how closely we work with other healthcare professionals. We work with nurses and doctors quite a bit. So the centrifuge is slowing down. It has spun the two samples together. So basically, your, my patient's cells have just been spun. But if you look here, this is my tube. That there is a blood clot. That's a glutination of the patient's cells. So because the blood clumped together within this solution, you know that this is what type of blood? This is an A person. Okay. Because I put A reagent in and the blood clumped. You have an A person. <laughs> we work shift work, so we have day shifts. Our day shifts start at 7.30 to 4. And then we have a person coming in at 2.30 till 11 o'clock at night, and they're our evening shift. So they're on call all night until the next morning. I was interested in chemistry and biology in high school, and then I went on to get a university degree in biochemistry. There is a degree you can get for medical laboratory te technologists, but I have a certification and it's a diploma. So it's a two and a half year program. The advantage of having a degree over the diploma is you do get paid extra and you can also uh, take a management position a little easier than that. But the diploma, everybody is certified. You take a certification exam and everybody is considered certified and you can work anywhere in Canada. There's always opportunities to further advance your education. You could specialize in another department like microbiology. Also, the uh, CSMLS, which is our certifying body, offers courses online that you can take and further advance. My advice for somebody straight out of school would be to go and do a lab tour, talk to somebody that works in a lab, a good medical laboratory technologist, pays attention to detail, they're considerate to others, they really do care about the well-being of people, even though you're not in the forefront and people don't always see you, it's nice to know that you're having an impact on somebody's life. To summarize, some of the skills that you'll need include manual dexterity, verbal and written comprehension, clerical ability, you'll also need to be social, detail-oriented, You'll usually require four or more years of post-secondary education. The average salary can range from $53,000 to $66,000 per year. The future outlook for this job is promising, as employment is increasing in the coming years. And the unemployment rate is low and is expected to further decrease. Jody, thank you so much for showing me around. Nice meeting you. Don't forget to wash your hands. You got it. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Once again, I'm Brian for Career Track, reminding you that this career could be yours. See you next time.
Has your interest been piqued? Looks pretty exciting. Well, there are two people I'd like to, uh, to introduce. Um, fairly recent graduates from our program, maybe not so recent. I, it's time passes by so quickly, I forget how long it's been since you've been here. But they've had some wonderful experiences out in the, in the clinical laboratory uh, profession and they'd like to share some of those experiences with you now. The first person I'd like to introduce is Megan McLennan. Good evening and welcome to this evening. Um, both everyone who made it here and everybody who is at home enjoying their comfy couch. Um, my name is Megan. I graduated from this program, Alan, six years ago. <laughs> um, I was where you were sitting right now in 2007, which dates myself just a little bit, but I was looking at the same choices that you guys are facing today. Um, I was trying to decide if this was a career that was right for me. I was trying to decide if I was willing to give up a pretty good job that I had at UBC as a research technician and willing to take a leap of faith and go back to school for two and a half years and do a program that I wasn't completely sure about. And as you can tell from the fact that I'm standing up here today talking to you, I obviously made the choice to go back to school. Uh, it has definitely been one of the better choices that I have ever made. Um, and I'm now going to tell you a little bit about what some of my experiences are like. There are people in this room tonight who are immensely more qualified than I am to talk to you about the application process, what the curriculum is going to look like. Um, even what the certifica certification exam consists of now. Uh, six years is a long time, and those things do have a habit of changing. What I can talk to you about tonight is a little bit about the lab. And you heard it in the video that you just watched. Everyone refers to the lab, but what kind of is the lab and what happens there? The first thing for you to know is that you have all probably encountered the lab in one way or another. I can probably guarantee most of you had to have your blood, have had your blood taken at some point in your life. Uh, maybe you've even had a throat swab done. Potentially you've got a friend who is a hemophiliac and is having blood products transfused. Um, maybe you've had a friend or relative who's had cancer. Potentially you've even donated blood. All of these things would put you in contact with the lab. And by extension, lab techs, which is what you're looking at becoming. The lab techs are those people who are on the other end of those specimens and those samples that you've given up at the entrance. So it probably sounds really cool when you hear it like that. Um, roughly 85% of people who walk through the front door of a hospital will have some kind of contact with the lab. They will likely have some kind of testing done with us. And you get to be at the other end of that, producing the results for that patient. But what does that look like? I will tell you right now, it looks like a lot of needles. In this program, you have to take blood. There is no way around it. Don't bother trying. If I had had an option, I would have found a way around it. So, you will be taking blood. And to learn to take blood, you have to practice. So not only will you be taking blood, you will be giving blood up as well because you gotta have someone to practice on and they're not just gonna let you go and poke a random patient. It doesn't quite work like that. It also looks like every bodily fluid that you could 
possibly imagine. Blood, urine, CSF, stool, pericardial fluid, peritoneal fluid, all of it can come to the lab. Which, if I put it like that, probably doesn't sound too bad. But what happens if I tell you that you're now going to have to process that really green, mucousy looking sputum? Or maybe you've got the bloody diarrhea that you've now got to plate out for some microbiology testing. Do you think you can handle it? And then there's fun and games. How about an autopsy? A lot of clinical sites will ask you to watch an autopsy. Uh, even if you don't get to the opportunity to watch an autopsy, you will pretty much be guaranteed that you will be working at some point in the anatomic pathology gross room, which means you're going to be handling people's organs or tissues that have been removed and need to be tested. So, I'm guessing by this point you figured out that if you're squeamish, this might not be the best career choice for you. But, having said all of that, it is an incredibly rewarding career and I would not change the fact that I chose it. Every time you walk into the lab, every time you go to your bench at the start of the day, you have the chance to make an impact in a patient's life. The doctor will take the results that you produce and will make a decision which could, for some patients, mean the difference between life and death. So, I started working at St. Paul's Hospital in downtown Vancouver, straight from my clinical practicum. It's where I did my practicum, it's where I had my first job, it is where I still work today. So I started in what is known as the core lab, which comprises of chemistry and hematology. I was a bench technologist, and I got to work shift work, which is a reality in the lab. You will work shift work, and I can tell you, I didn't like 3 a.m. then, I do not particularly like 3 a.m. now, but it's the way it goes. Including that, lab tech is also a relatively physically demanding job. You'll be standing on your feet probably for many hours a day, and over five days a week, maybe four days a week if you work longer shifts but it is physically demanding. So, we've come to this, that's kind of what it is, and three years ago, I had done my job as a bench tech in chemistry and hematology, and I had the chance to apply and was awarded the research coordinator position at St. Paul's. Now, this is what you might call a non-standard job for a technologist. It's not one of the things that you first think of when you hear the words, I'm a medical lab technologist. But there are careers out there for lab techs that aren't just bench tech jobs and the very linear way that goes up from that. So through a bench tech to a supervisor to management. So my job description now is any study that operates in the hospital and needs a lab service, no matter what it is, has to come through me. Now these could be small scale, independent, investigator driven, so maybe it's just a doctor with a question and they've got an idea and they want to run with it. They could be large scale, pharmaceutically funded clinical trials that are looking at the newest, latest, and greatest drugs on the market, or that they're hoping to get to market. And if they need a lab service, they come and talk to me. So it could be they just need blood drawn, they need phlebotomy, maybe they need specimens processed, 
Maybe they're looking for some cultures for microbiology, or they need some tissue sections for some specialized staining that they want to do. All of that comes through me, and I basically, I review, I approve, and then I manage the study. Now take that concept and multiply it by about 100 currently active studies, and you have what I do every day. One thing that I do want you to take away from what I'm telling you right now is the fact that not every job is a bench tech job and not every job is actually even in a hospital. Some people really aren't fans of hospitals. A lot of lab techs are employed by them, but not all of them are. There's an organization called the Canadian Blood Services, CBS. You might have heard of them because if you've donated blood, you will have gone to one of their mobile clinics or potentially you've gone to their office on Oak Street. They are responsible for the blood supply and blood products in Canada. They hire lab techs. Uh, you've got Life Labs. You've got Valley Medical Labs, which operates in the Okanagan. So these are private labs that also hire techs. And you've got of all people, the Canadian military. They have a lovely web page for lab techs and an email address that they want you to contact. So those are some opportunities for different employers potentially for lab techs that aren't in hospitals. But even if you're in a hospital, there are roles like mine that aren't traditional roles. There's people who work in quality and quality management, ensuring that the product that we put out is acceptable. It meets expectations and hopefully exceeds the standards that are set for us. We have lab information systems. So we need computer people who operate those LIS systems for us and maintain them so that we can do our daily work. And then there's industry. There are companies out there that are all based on assay development, analyzer platforms, updating those platforms, creating new ones, and kind of like your car, the newest, latest, and greatest comes along. So what I'm hoping that you will take home from this tonight is the fact that MedLab Tech has multiple facets. It's got many faces, and the decision facing you now is whether one of those faces will work for you. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, alumni I'd like to invite up here is Mandy Feng. All right, good evening everyone. Um, my name is Mandy and I graduated from this program last summer and I'm currently working in transfusion at BC Children's and Women's Hospital. So I'm not, a very exper I'm not as experienced as Megan as a lab tech, so I don't have that much to talk about, about this profession, but I can tell you about life as a BCIT student. So first of all, can I see a show of hands? How many of you actually has a post-secondary degree? That's quite a bit. Okay, me too. So. I graduated from UBC Biochemistry at, in 2011, and I wasn't too sure what I was gonna do. I, w I wasn't about to give up about, like I wasn't going to give up on science, I was still really passionate about it, but I just didn't, I didn't have a direction. Until I was invited to a med lab tour at Surrey Memorial, and I was fascinated with everything there. And I thought, since this incorporates science into something that's practical, why don't I give it a try? And fair enough, I'm really happy about this decision. So, um, BCIT. I really like the, the teaching system and the learning environment at BCIT. First of all, they break down the class into smaller groups of 20 people, and that's where we did most of our learning, our seminars, our labs. And so the instructors are able to give us the attention that we need and make sure that no one falls behind. And secondly, all the classes are relevant to MedLab. And what that means is that each, like all the classes are geared towards making you 
like preparing you to become a professional med lab tech. So there isn't a class that makes you wonder like, why in the world am I taking this class? Like, why am I wasting my time? No, but I am not going to lie to you. I'm going to be very honest. This program is intense and that's coming from a student who never studied past 12 during her undergrad years. So it's everything is really fast paced. Um, you're given a short amount of time and within that time period you have to learn everything you need to learn you get as much practice as possible and then it's exam time they just push you into the the deep end of the water and so it's and this cycle just repeats itself over and over again it's almost like exam after exam after exam it's really really exhausting and i hope i'm not scaring away some potential students right here but yes that that's how it's like at bcit but Thankfully, I met some truly amazing people in this class. Um, before that, I didn't really like studying in a group setting because I never find it really helpful for myself. But because this program is so overwhelming, it's so stressful, I knew I wouldn't be able to make it through this program without friends. And because of that, throughout the two and a half years, everyone made friends. They, they found like truly amazing friends. And there are also instructors that are really great at giving the support that you need. So overall, I really, really like my experience. I really enjoy my experience at BCIT. But there are still days where I would be, I would be ripping my hair out and asking why would BCIT do this to me. So, and then practicum came and that answered my question. I was so surprised that the moment I started, I was so well prepared. I, I was so shocked myself. And that's because with all the, the practice and repetition at BCIT, it pretty much transformed all the skills and knowledge into almost like a, a second nature. And none of us were actually even aware how much we knew. It was, we were actually impressed with ourselves. So I was so prepared to the point where I felt like if they were to train me on a bench for a week, I would actually be able to handle it for most parts on my own. And that's how prepared I was. So yeah, and I, got, I was really lucky. I got hired at, right after practicum in transfusion, which happened to, me, my, to be my favorite department. And in fact, everyone was, got hired right away. And so three years ago, I, was, I never thought I would be able to find a stable job in such a short period of time, let alone a job that I actually really, really enjoy. And, but yeah, and because of this program, people found a direction, people gained valuable friendships, and some people actually even found their loved ones in the class, and a couple actually recently got engaged. Congrats to them. But then, yeah, that's a really sweet bonus on the side. Most importantly, <laughs> well, no puns intended. Most importantly, everyone actually found a career and possibly a lifelong career that we are very proud of, we really enjoyed. And yeah, so I'd love to tell you more about MedLab, but time is kind of running out. And if you need opinions or advice from a student or a fresh graduate's perspective, feel free to ask me any question after this info session. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. It's made me want to come back to the program. Um, your time spent at BCIT, your three terms here um, follow, are followed up by a very important uh, almost year of your life in clinical training and uh, you wouldn't be able to succeed without the uh, huge amount of effort and, and expertise that you get in your clinical training. And so we work closely with our clinical partners and I would like to introduce uh, some of them to you today. Uh, they will be present in the, uh, in the town square A and B for you to, uh, to meet with and talk with after the session here. Um, is Alex here? Alex Koo? Oh, there you are. Hi, Alex. He is from the uh, Lower Mainland Laboratory Services and Vancouver Coastal Health and some of the other people that are, are with Vancouver Coastal Health in Providence. Uh, Daryl, right there. Daryl Guthrow. Uh, Carol Jeffries. Carol Jeffries here. See right there. Oh, sorry. There you go. Oh, hi. Um, Kelly Hull. 
right there. And uh, Heather Ma, there. Uh, let's see, Nadia Gale. And from Life Labs, uh, Andrea Simmons Coleman, right there in the back. And right beside her, Julian Foe. Okay. And uh, Malcolm Ashford from the BC Society of Medical Lab Science. Oh, I don't see him here. He may be present at the, uh, at the session. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, the next person, uh, Babina uh, Gradia, to talk. Uh, she's from Program Advising, and uh, she will provide an overview of Program Advising and BCIT services for you. All right, so I'm Babina. Um, I work with a team of 11 advisors in the program advising office and uh, we can assist you with information about all sorts of programs at BCIT, entrance requirements, uh, upgrading options, taking challenge exams, uh, strengthening applications to competitive programs, the application process itself, uh, program start dates, costs, as well as the transfer credit application process. Now, I am going to briefly cover the entrance requirements and the admission process. I'll also touch on some of the services that are offered here at BCIT and then provide you some information on how you can contact us if you've got any further questions after you leave the session here today. So what is the application process? Well, for you, you should first uh, review the entrance requirements and check the application deadlines. So for this particular program, um, the deadline is June the 1st. And the courses that are required for entry include English, Biology, Chemistry, uh, Physics, and Math. Now, what I want you to keep in mind is that these requirements, um, out of these requirements, the Biology, Chemistry, and Math requirements, they must be completed within five years to the start of the program. So, what does that mean? If you are um, coming into the program for the January 2017 intake, it means that you must have completed the biology, uh, chemistry, and math requirements from January 2012 until the end of May um, 2016. So that's the time frame that needs to be completed within. Now, if you had completed your studies prior to that date, upgrading will be required. Again, applications for the 27 intake, 2017 intake are uh, currently being accepted, and they'll be accepted until June 1st. Admission is very competitive. And please do uh, look at the complete list of entrance requirements on the Medical Laboratory Science Program's webpage. <clears throat> so when you're ready to apply, um, what you need to know is you can apply with midterm grades or final grades, or um, you can even take challenge exams. Now with the challenge exams, uh, you should only consider them if you've met the course requirement and the grade requirement, but not the recency requirement, okay? And you are absolutely confident that you can achieve uh, at least 73% in the material that's gonna be covered in the exam. We don't provide any study material, so it's really important um, that you kind of look within yourself to, to figure out, you know, do I really know this material and should I take the challenge exam? And that exam can only be attempted once. So if you think, oh, I'm going to take the challenge exam, the deadline's in June, I'll take the exam um, in March, and then you don't pass the exam, you don't get the 73%, what you have to ask yourself is, am I going to have time to be able to go back and do an upgrading course? And so if you're a little unsure about doing really well in that challenge exam, don't do the challenge exam. I, my recommendation is to find an upgrading course to ensure that you can apply with a midterm or a final grade by the application deadline of June the 1st. Uh, documents and the application uh, for the program, everything is submitted online. So your transcripts, um, you will be scanning them, saving them as a PDF, and then uploading them to your online application. When you receive your transcripts from your high school or your post-secondary, it'll come in an envelope and it'll say do not open or don't break the seal you actually do have to open up that envelope and then you're going to open up the documents, you're going to scan them, again, save them as a PDF file and then upload them to your online application. The application process is quite simple. Um, you create a BCIT ID, just self-report how you've um, met the entrance requirements and then upload the documents that are required. 
Uh, you can apply online at bcit.ca forward slash apply. So what happens after you've submitted your application? Well, this uh, admission to this program is competitive, so it's similar to applying for a job where uh, you would meet the minimum qualifications, submit your application, the employer reviews to ensure that the minimum requirements have been met, and then from the pool of applicants, they then choose those that they want to call in for an interview. And then after all candidates have been interviewed, then final decisions are made. So it's similar to what we do here. Um, so after the application is submitted, the admissions office will assess and confirm that you've met the minimum requirements. If you have, they will send your application to the department for further review. Um, if you haven't met the requirements, then you'll be notified by the admissions office. If your application is sent for departmental review, um, they will then obviously add to their uh, pool of, of um, applicants and then decide on who they want to shortlist for the multiple mini interview. These interviews take place um, usually May to the end of June and uh, final decisions for admission are not made until all shortlisted applicants have been interviewed. So you probably, if, you're, if you've been shortlisted or if you will be shortlisted, um, you will be uh, hearing back from the program area probably towards the end of June or sometime in the beginning of July. Once you become a student, uh, you do have access to the Financial Aid and Awards Office, the Disability Resource Center, the library, peer tutoring, employment services, health services, recreation services, student association, clubs. Now, uh, just to focus a little bit on, uh, on awards, uh, scholarships, awards, and bursaries, I actually know of a student who completed a four-year program, not at BCIT elsewhere, but he applied for every scholarship, award, and bursary that was out there, and he was able to fund the majority of his education all through, um, well, not from his own pocket, but through the awards, scholarships, and bursaries that he received. So. It takes time to put these applications together just as it's going to take time to put the application together for this for entry into this program, but the results are truly worth it. And if you want to learn more about some of our programs, um, you can register for Spend a Day, uh, check out some of the student blogs, check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Flickr. Um, I know the health science students, they're um, very, uh, um, they share a lot of their stories. So with, with the student blogs, um, I, I highly encourage you to have a look at some of those blogs. They talk about their experiences. We've heard some of them today. Um, but they'll talk about their experiences from um, preparing their application to being in the program to graduating. So do have a look there if you've got some time. And if you'd like to contact us, uh, we do offer drop-in advising sessions for our full-time programs. We also offer telephone advising during the week. And you can even email us at program underscore advising at bcit.ca. Now, I do encourage email over uh, the drop-ins and the, um, the call services only because it allows us to be able to send you material in writing that you can even reference back to at a later date. And it gives you the opportunity to, um, to correspond with the same advisor um, if you've got any further questions. That brings me to the end of the program advising section, and we're opening up to questions. Yep. Any questions? Yes. Um, for upgrading and such, for the recency requirements, for students from Alberta, would you recommend contacting Alberta Education or doing it through BC Education? Um, we can provide you some feedback on uh, upgrading courses in Alberta. So I would recommend that you send us an email, and then we can, depending on where you want to go, so indicate what, wh what institution you plan on going to, and we can send you some feedback. So the options you would have is um, upgrading um, the high school equivalent. So a lot of colleges offer the equivalent of, say, chemistry, um, and they offer that at the, high, at, the, at the college. But they also offer, obviously, higher level uh, chemistry courses as well. So we can give you some feedback on what your different options are. Um, for the recency requirements for um, the, the grade 12 courses, would something like a post-secondary course, like say if you had calculus, would that count uh, as uh, equivalent? You can use post-secondary level calculus towards the math requirement. It still has to meet the 73% um, grade requirement and the recency requirement as well. 
Yeah, we do accept post-secondary equivalents. The biology one you want to be a little careful about because um, it has to be human biology. And so if you are on the admissions website and if you look under equivalencies, uh, there is a PDF at the end of that, at the bottom of that web page. And if you open that up, you can see what the acceptable biology 12 equivalents are from within BC. Yep. Absolutely, you can, yeah. Could you please repeat the question for the online people? Oh, yeah. sorry, okay. So the, the question was, can you, can you submit both your high school and your post-secondary transcripts? And the answer is yes, you can submit both transcripts. Um, the online application will um, ask you to self-report how you meet each requirement. But because admission to this program is competitive, you should submit not just um, transcripts to prove that you've met the minimum requirements, but obviously the more post-secondary you have, the better it's going to be for you. At the back there. The question was, how many applications do we receive for the 80 seats? I think there's about two to three applications for one seat. Any other questions? Are there any online questions? Um, so one of the online questions, um, how many students were pulled up from the waiting list around this past time? Okay, well the question was, how many students were pulled from the waiting list in the last intake? Mm -hmm. um, I think we went 20 to 25 down the wait list, if my memory serves me correct. That's, that's not foolproof, but um, I think it's, yeah, about 20 to 25. So that's kind of what we went down. And the, the wait list is not something that carries over to the next intake. Every intake is fresh. Um, so those people that were on the waiting list that didn't make it into a particular intake, they would have to go through the application and MMI process again. So if there's, if there's no other questions, uh, we would like to invite you to uh, meet us in Town Square A and B uh, to meet with our clinical partners. And you certainly can ask additional questions there. It's more of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, scenario. Um, if you go out the doors there and turn left, the doors to get into Town Square A and B are right across from the doors to the Rick's Cafe. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, hope you found it informative and will really help to, uh, to, for you to make a decision on where you'd like to go for your career. Thank you very much.